the first thing I would like to do is really to acquaint you with my family. Uh, my grandfather founded the company in 1875. He didn't know how dangerous smoking was. So before the introduction of Camel cigarettes in 1913, he uh, talked to his brothers and he said, I think that this paper in the cigarettes might cause cancer. And of course, we know today it was the tobacco and all the tar and, uh, that's causing the cancer. But his brother said to him, don't worry, RJ, we tested the cigarette paper in St. Louis and Baltimore and it doesn't cause cancer. And RJ said, roll them out. Camel cigarettes made marketing history because there was full page ads, the same full page ads in a number of papers nationally the same day all across the country. It was the first time that had ever been done. And cigarette marketing or advertising after that uh, went on to become a very powerful tool to help get our young people addicted and to get people addicted as a rule, as a, as a whole. Pretty soon, about half the country, almost half the country was smoking. And my grandfather didn't get married until he was later in life because he was so busy building up a big company. So my father was born in 1906 when my grandfather was 53. Now grandfather chewed tobacco and he died of cancer of the pancreas, which may have contributed to his death. And he died when my father was only 12. So my father had no father, no father to take him to the baseball game, to take care of him. And he knew he was gonna inherit a lot of money and he had a teenage fascination later, a few years after his, the patriarch's death with airplanes. So later he would become a big stockholder in the airlines and financier of Delta Airlines, among others. My dad would uh, inherit a great deal of money when he was very young, which probably was not a good idea. He would go on to get married four times and bought a 200 foot yacht and a, <laughs> lived on a private island, which he later funded a professor who uh, wrote a paper called The Ecology of the Salt Marsh, and that helped kick off our modern ecology movement in 1958. And the paper was acclaimed in scientific circles uh, uh, that showing the fragility of the cycle of nature in the wetlands. So I'm very proud of my dad for doing things like that. And he helped put Harry Truman in office, the president with his cash contributions, and his later uh, President Roosevelt. Before that, President Roosevelt. Roosevelt had helped get us through the Depression, and Truman helped get us through World War II. My father's second wife was my mother. He showered her with rubies and emeralds, and she was a very beautiful woman under contract to Warner Brothers as a starlet in the 1940s. They fell madly in love. She gave up her career, and uh, you know, hope was going to live happily ever after with my dad. But unfortunately, they got divorced after seven years. So there I was. There I am, just born on the right. Do not go aw. <laughs> All right, moving on. Here's where we want to get to. Here I'm, a, you know, maybe five, six years old, whatever. And I'm a couple, few years down the road. My, my dad left when I was three. And a boy needs his father to come to the football game to say, you played well, son. You're my boy. I love you. Boy needs his dad's arms around him, needs his dad to give him words of encouragement and love. And I did not have that. A quick show of hands, how many of you uh, do not have your biological father living in the house with you right now. Wow, thank you, I appreciate that. So we've had a lot of fathers who don't live in the house. And I do not know how you feel about it. But today, I invite you to open your hearts and get in touch with your feelings. And we'll be talking about that today. Are you a little sad? That's okay. Are you a little angry? It's okay. Anger doesn't have to be a big temper tantrum, like I'm furious. It could be I'm a little angry that you know my dad isn't around as much as I want, or I'm a little sad, I'm a little frightened without him there. 
I felt all three of those things. I felt a little angry, I was sad, very sad, and kind of afraid. They called me sad sack, look at me. <laughs> That's with the fire department of New York guy coming to visit for a fundraiser at our house in New York City. So when I was nine, I wrote my dad a letter. And the letter said, dear dad, I want to meet you. Where are you? He was traveling, going from place to place. And everywhere he went, he left a forwarding address. So by a miracle from God, the letter got into his hands and he sent for me. And I was like, yeah, wow, I'm going to get to meet my dad. Oh boy, it was such an exciting moment. And when they showed me into the room where my father was, I found him there lying down on his back, gasping for breath. And I said, dad, what's wrong? I have asthma, son. Well, anything to do with your smoking? I don't know. I don't think so. And he had a cigarette in his hand. There was R.J. Reynolds, the son of the man who founded the company that makes Camel cigarettes, Winston's, Salem's, dying from the product that made our family rich and powerful, denying that cigarettes had anything to do with it. I only got to see him about five times after that. Every time he was increasingly sick and frail and counting the time that he had left to live. Cigarettes took my dad from me when I was 15 years old. And that had a great deal to do with why I would choose to turn my back on my heritage and walk away, and why I vowed to do everything in my power to connect with our young people, to keep you tobacco free, to keep you drug free, and I will do this work the rest of my life, and that's why I founded the Foundation for a Smoke-Free America in Los Angeles, where I live. And I fought for cigarette laws to limit smoking and, oh gosh, raise tobacco taxes to price them out of the range where you would want to spend your money on them and keep kids from starting. And I'll do this work as long as I live. Now, if I could give you one message today, one takeaway to take home and remember, it would be this. Cigarettes are addictive. Once you start smoking, you cannot stop. It's almost impossible to stop smoking. Well, Mr. Reynolds, how quickly can I get hooked? Well, um, according to the studies, smoking two or three cigarettes a day, somebody 11 to 13 years old can get hooked in as little as two weeks. One out of four people, 11 to 13, get hooked, addicted, for the next 17 years on average, spending $3.50 to $6 a pack on a pack of cigarettes every day for the next 17 years, why, what could you do with that money? What could you do with the money you would save? You could get your first car in a few couple of years. You could do a lot of things, see more movies. Now, how hard is it to stop smoking? Let's discuss that. It's almost impossible. Uh, how many of you, by the way, let's stop the talk for a second. How many of you have seen somebody you know at school here smoking a cigarette? Quick show of hands. Thank you for not talking to your neighbor in the last seven days. We've seen some smoking. Okay, how many of you, thank you. How many of you have seen someone you know at school here uh, using inhalants in the last seven days? Okay, we've got some inhalant. What about uh, any methamphetamine? Okay, one, two, my word. Someone your own age? How about uh, cocaine? Someone your own age, you've seen using cocaine? We've got some cocaine. Now, what I've noticed, without looking in any particular direction here, is that the, where we saw the hands for tobacco, is also where we saw the hands for the drugs. I want to stop and talk about drugs. Drugs will destroy your life. You can forget about going to college. You can forget about having a family. You can forget about having a decent job and a decent career if you are using drugs. Make my mistake. Drugs will destroy your life. You're done. You need to say no to someone who's offering you drugs because your life is in the toilet. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200.
Don't you forget college, a family, all the things that could make you happy are gone with the drugs and your brain fries. There's a commercial that used to be on TV. We saw an egg, and underneath the egg it said, this is your brain. And then suddenly we saw the egg in a frying pan, and it said, this is your brain on drugs. Any questions? So it fries your brain cells. And it's not funny, because your life is on the line. I want to move on now. How quickly, again, let's go back to quitting smoking. Some of you may be addicted to tobacco. Quick show of hands, how many of you have seen somebody you know at school uh, using smokeless or spit tobacco or snooze, any of that? Have you seen any, 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 somebody your own age using the smokeless tobacco products? Okay, we've got some smokeless tobacco. Thank you. Smokeless tobacco products are as addicting as cigarettes. They're equally addicting. Once you start, you can't stop. And if you want to be hooked on a product that can cause mouth cancer and gum cancer, uh, it's a big mistake. And you may think that you can stop any time, but if you, if you can't. 85% of people, no, 95 out of 100 people, 95% who try to stop smoking without being in a program or getting any help, I'm just going to quit smoking and I can do this myself, no help. 95 out of 100 go back to cigarettes or spit tobacco within 12 months. Now, if you get the best programs we have, nicotine replacement like the gum or the patch or, uh, you know, and all the counseling and all the good things that we offer uh, and that the school nurse can offer you, I don't know if she'll do the nicotine part, but certainly the nurse can help you stop. If you are addicted and if, if you're not even sure if you're addicted, try to stop and see what happens. But with all the powers and, and tools in our arsenal to help people quit smoking, nothing works. With the nicotine replacement, 85 out of 100 people who use it are smoking or chewing again within 12 months. 12 months, and you're back. 85 out of 100 fail. Now, but if you look at the glass of water as being half full, it means that you have a 5% chance of success with no program, but a 15% chance if you get in a program, okay? So your chances of success triple if at quitting smoking or tobacco if you get some help. You in life, and this is a big theme that'll come back once again in my talk, and another takeaway message, people who succeed best turn to other people and get help. They ask the teacher questions when they go past something that they do not understand. Be relentless. Excuse me, teacher, I didn't understand that. Excellence only takes a little more effort and a little more boldness. I know you get a lot of homework. Do it twice. Go back. Study your homework again. Because excellence only takes just a little bit more effort. People who succeed best in life connect with other people to get help. In business, a businesswoman gets a lawyer to write the contracts. She gets a marketing person to do the marketing. She or he gets an, uh, oh, a doctor when they're sick, a marriage counselor when their family's in trouble. People who succeed best turn to other people and get help. So if you're having trouble quitting, see the school nurse and see the school counselor. If you're carrying around some deep, dark secret that you never told anybody, ladies and gentlemen, that is like carrying around a 500-pound weight everywhere you go. Oh my gosh, I can't tell anybody that. It's too shameful. I can't tell. Set the weight down and talk to a trusted teacher, the school counselor, your friends, your parents, and together we'll solve whatever the problem is, I promise you.